Good morning, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Amen. Amen. As we look back over the last few weeks, I want you to consider a few different things. First of all, we had the Pregnancy Network come and talk to us, and you may ask the question, and you may beg the question, I, I would suggest that, what does the Pregnancy Network have to do with missions? Well, it's a local mission. It's a local mission that our church supports. In Acts 1-8, we're told to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outer parts of the earth. Jerusalem is around this church. Jerusalem is Frybridge Road, Loop Road, Central Road, Nestleway, all the streets behind, uh, down, down, down my road, Sterling Forest Drive. All of these roads are Jerusalem. They are the, what surrounds the church? Judea would be places that you would reach out a little bit further into, say, for South County, Davidson County, Pregnancy Network, Rescue Mission, things of that nature. The outer parts of the world, Samaria, would be the parts of the world where you would go on a mission trip. So I beg the question to you this morning. Have you ever been on a mission trip outside of this country? Well, maybe you haven't. Maybe you have. If you have, I will dare say that it has changed your life. Now, you don't have to leave this continent to go on a mission trip. I helped support a mission that was in West Virginia some 15 or so years ago where we rebuilt a church that had been wiped away by a flood. That was a mission trip. The church was rebuilt in the name of the Lord, and they worship there to this day. Praise God. But I dare say if you've been on a mission trip outside of this country, it's changed your life. And it's made you ever mindful of what some of the apostles, say Barnabas, Paul, and Timothy, and all of these gentlemen experienced in the Bible. Not only maybe spiritual trials and maybe some spiritual warfare in the midst of actually getting to that mission trip, but the blessings that come along with it, it will forever wreck your life for the good. And so I want to challenge you, as I repeat one more time, if you haven't been, you better go on one at some point before your life comes to an end. God will change your heart for the good when it comes to missions. Paul experienced this very same thing when Christ came to him on the road to Damascus. He forever changed his heart. He forever changed his life. And he was forever changed for the gospel of Jesus Christ to proclaim it to a broken and hurting world. Well, there was a mission trip that Paul went on to a community called Lystra. And it was there where Paul was dragged outside the city and he was stoned. They left him for dead. And here's what Ray's personal opinion is. And you can say I'm exaggerating or I'm over-spiritualizing. That's up to you. I, I don't really care. I'm going to tell you what I think. I think Paul died because it says here that Paul was called up into the third heaven. He writes, I want you to understand something. He writes 2 Corinthians chapter 12 just after his experience in Lystra. He does, or Lystra. And so Paul has experienced things with the closeness in the Lord being called up into the third heaven and being given revelations that are absolutely extraordinary and presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ to a broken and hurting world. He understands once he receives these revelations that God's grace is sufficient. You see, when Paul's weak, God will make him strong. Do you understand that? Do you believe that very thing about God Almighty? Do you believe that in your weaknesses, God will make you strong? If you do, I dare say that that mission trip that you're considering, or maybe you haven't considered, may be just for you. Because if it is just for you, you may say, I'm not qualified, capable, or able. Well, God say, will, say, will say to you this, in your weaknesses, I will make you strong. Consider those things. It's also in 2 Timothy chapter 3 where Paul encourages, <clears throat> excuse me, encourages Timothy. 
He encourages him that even though he's going to be persecuted, he's going to be criticized, he's going to be misunderstood, that he needs to continue to preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the known world. Disobedience is never going to be an option for Timothy. It wasn't for Paul. It should not be for us either. We are called to obedience before Jesus Christ. We are all called to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are all ministers and missionaries. We're called to humility before God's throne of grace to accomplish the great tasks that he's asked us to set out to accomplish. So why is the church mission-minded? It's to reach a hurting and broken world. There is someone in your life today that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And is today going to be that day that you bring them to Jesus Christ saving grace with the gospel that you present to them? Or will they continue to go on their merry way on their merry day and never know what Jesus Christ can and will do for them? God's called you to be a mouthpiece for the gospel of Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, listen to what Paul says. You, however, have followed my teachings. He's talking to Timothy. My conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. You also followed my persecution sufferings that happened to me in Antioch. And Iconum and in Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Paul endured them. Are you willing to endure persecutions, hardships for Christ's sake? Dear God, I pray you are. Yet from all the Lord rescued, excuse me, yet from all them the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Nobody is going to get past it. You're not going to get around it. You're not going to go over it, under it. You will go through it. You will be persecuted, mocked, made fun of, and lied about. Because guess what? The prophets were lied about as well. No surprise. Get used to it. Be prepared to endure it. But don't be an imposter. Don't be an imposter. Don't allow yourself to be deceived and don't deceive anyone. But as for you, continue in, in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. Paul is telling Timothy, yeah, you learned it from me, but I learned it from Jesus Christ. I learned it when he met me on the road to Damascus and he forever changed my life. I was once blind, but now I see. Do you see? Do you understand the gospel truth? Are you willing to present that to a broken and hurting world? I trust that you are. You can't be just acquainted with the sacred, sacred writings in the gospel. You have to know them. You have to be able to live them out. You have to learn to be wise and present the salvation of the gospel of Christ to those who do not know Jesus Christ. Paul drew a line here, and it was clear. It was absolutely clear. It was a dividing line that Timothy would be ruled by the Spirit of God, not by the Spirit of the latter days. False teachings, false doctrines, false truths. He was to live a manner that Paul had presented to him, a manner of life, of a purpose of faith, of long-suffering, of love, of perseverance, of persecutions being placed upon him of afflictions that would come his way and he would continue to endure them for the cause of Christ are you willing to do the very same are you willing to be mission minded for the cause of others for the sake of Christ in our day I dare say many are not they're not willing to accept it they're not willing to be hurt by the world around them at large they're fearful but can I remind you of something? Perfect love casts out fear. And if perfect love comes from Jesus Christ, then can I ask, what do you have to be fearful of? Absolutely nothing. Even about laws that have just been passed in recent 
days in Muslim countries such as Syria and Afghanistan and, and China and even Russia where they have absolutely made it their life's work to run missionaries out of the countries. Will you still go? Will you be a one that crosses the border? Will you be that one that crosses the border in the dead of night and dump Bibles in a village? Or, if you can't physically, will you send somebody that will? I ask you that question. Paul didn't merely teach Timothy how to live. He showed him. Are you willing to show others how to live for Christ? Are you willing to put on the armor of God and be willing to accept that spiritual warfare, that battle that just may come your way? Are you willing? Are you willing to be an example of Jesus Christ, even as he was hanging on the cross, persecuted, mocked, lied about, made fun of, and put to death? Are you willing to continue to teach, to preach the gospel truth in a broken world? You see, I want to tell you something. Paul's life that he reflected to Timothy, it was contagious. Absolutely contagious. It wasn't something that was to be just an example, something to just be talked about. It was contagious for Christ. Is your life contagious for Christ? You see, Paul's life while he was sitting in a prison cell was contagious for Christ. He was awaiting execution. He was chained down to two guards. He was looking at them day in and day out in a dank, dark dungeon with feces and fecal matter and rats running all over him with rotten food. And he's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is your life contagious for Christ? Are you willing to endure persecution, hardship? for the truth that's in God's holy word. Missionary Jim Elliott and his friends were. They stood in a river in Ecuador and presented the gospel truth to tribesmen in the river bank. And that very day, their lives were taken from them, but they never backed down. Jim Elliott and his friends lost their lives for the cause of the gospel of Christ. What will you do Will you stand up and preach the gospel of salvation even in the face of death? Oh, I pray that's you. I pray that you're willing to do that very thing. If we're not willing to, then we must ask ourselves, are we willing to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior? Have we done that very thing and have we meant what we've said? Hey, because I'm going to tell you something. There's always going to be enemies of Christ. There's always going to be enemies of this world. There's always going to be spiritual battles and warfares that are going on in the heavenly realms. There's always going to be imposters of the faith. But are you going to be the one that stands up for the truth? And not an imposter? Are you willing, if you can't go on that mission field, to send someone that can? It just says in 1 John 2, 24, Therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. You've heard the truth. Have you heard the truth? Do you know that Jesus Christ died and was buried and resurrected for the forgiveness of your sins? I trust you do. If you haven't heard that, then we need to talk today. If you've heard that truth, then I trust you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. And if you've heard that truth and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, then I trust that you're willing to tell others. I know many people today that that's their life's goal. Whether they're walking down the sidewalk in their neighborhood or whether they're in the grocery store, they just want to tell somebody about Jesus. Paul encouraged Timothy. And family, I want to encourage you today. Here's what's the most important thing. Abide in God's truth. Never let go of it. Never give in. Never back down. Can I ask you a question? I want you to stop and I want you to think for just one moment. Every one of you. Maybe it's your next door neighbor that hasn't heard the gospel. Maybe. 
Maybe it's the person in the house that lives right beside of you. Maybe it's the person in, your house, in the house that lives across the street from you. That's your mission field. Huh. You know why? Because God puts you right where you are in that moment in time just for that very purpose. That's your mission field. So don't tell me you have to leave this soil to go on a mission trip. You can walk across the street and you can tell your neighbor, hey, I would love to have you come visit me at church this Sunday. Would you love to come? I can come take you. I can bring you there. And their lives could be forever changed. Their lives could be forever changed. So <clears throat> there's a few things we can learn from just this part. Let me go through them with you. Paul gave Timothy ministry opportunity. Paul gave Timothy ministry opportunity. Christ gave it to Paul. God's given you one as well. Mm. God has given you one as well. Paul taught him, Timothy, by both word and example. Paul taught Timothy by both word and example. Isn't it time for you to go do the same? Isn't it time for you to go do the same? Paul laid hands on Timothy and he ordained him. He hollered at him, preach! Preach, as we'll later see. God has made every one of us ministers of the gospel of Christ. So you know what I'm going to tell you? Preach! Preach. Paul guided and mentored him in the midst of ministry. Paul guided him, being Timothy, in the midst of ministry. You know, I was blessed to have a man mentor me for years. If it had not been for that man behind me, pushing me, shoving me, I may dare well or very well had quit sometimes. But he encouraged me and he loved me and he shoved me and he kicked me in the hindsight when I didn't feel like going on any further. I dare say that somebody may be trying to do that to you today. If not, then I dare say that I will. How about that? Any number of people can mentor you. And guess what? When it comes time, you can mentor someone else. But here's what you must do. You must be confident. You must be strong. You must believe. You must love others. You must love others. You must love others as Christ has loved you. And act in a sense of urgency. Why? Because today could be the last day. Today could be your last. Today could be your last. Their last. So can I just give you some encouragement? For goodness sakes, preach the word. Preach. Preach. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. See, Paul understood as he sat in that prison cell, there was a sense of urgency in preaching the gospel of Christ. And he wanted Timothy to be a living testimony to Jesus Christ's saving grace. To preach the gospel, can I tell you, in some sense of a matter, it's demanded of us. It's demand us. Called, Paul, the God Almighty has called us to obey. And that is a step in obedience toward our Creator. We're to be a living testimony of what Jesus Christ is doing in our lives. First of all, he saved us, saved us of our sins. He's given us a place of eternity in heaven. And he gives us reward. 
And he wants us to show others that they can have that very same gift. To be a testimony. So give your testimony. But you're to do it with gentleness and humbleness. As it says, as what Peter says. Verse 2, let me just go back and read again. Preach the word. Be ready in season and in out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with patience and with teaching. Here's a few more things we can learn, family. Here's a few more things. Don't be ashamed of your testimony. Everybody's got one. Don't be ashamed of that testimony. It's the one the Lord has given you. Hold fast to the pattern of sound words and doctrines. Why? Right here's your truth. Don't sway from it. Don't walk away from it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. There's 66 books here that can tell you exactly how you're supposed to live from Jesus Christ. Sound words and doctrine. The things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, commit these things to being faithful. Commit these things to being faithful. 2 Timothy chapter 2, learn how Rightly divide the word. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that I just open up God's word every day and I just read. Oh, wait a minute. Psalm 118. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Interesting fact. That is in the very absolute, complete, dead center of your Bible. And my Bible just happened to open up to that. That's where I usually put all my sermons is in the dead center of my Bible because my sermons are supposed to be in the dead center of God's Word. It's not for me just to be able to read that, but I need to understand what that Word is actually saying to me. I better take refuge in the Lord than to take refuge in man. I better trust in the Lord than to take refuge in princes. Man will let you down. Man will hurt you. Man will disappoint you, but Jesus Christ will never let you down. He will never leave you, nor will he ever forsake you. And if you understand how to rightly divide his word, you will know that very fact for yourself. Rightly divide his word. You must learn to be a servant of the Lord. Oh, but wait a minute, I'm not done. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2 as well, verse 24. And you've got to be able to teach. Some people say, well, God's not called me to teach. I beg to differ. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24, has just told you. You need to be prepared to teach. No get-out-of-jail-free card on teaching. If you've got God's Word in your heart, then you've got God's Word in your heart to give it to somebody else. Don't give me any cop-outs. And all scriptures God breathed and inspired by God, 2 Timothy 3.16. If you doubt it, won't you try to prove me wrong? But I got a feeling I'll win that argument. All scriptures God breathed. See, I want you to understand something. As a pastor, as a preacher, that's what Paul taught Timothy to do, was to be a preacher. He wasn't required just to merely know the Word. He wasn't merely required just to approve the Word. He was required to preach the Word. Spoiler alert, you got to open your mouth, speak the truth. you got to preach the Word. The Word of God must be preached by Timothy, and guess what? It's got to be preached by you too. No get outs. Why? Because that's the Great Commission. It's the Great Commission. And the church is supposed to be mission minded. Go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the outer parts of the world. But here's what we need we need people to speak the truth. We don't need people that are just going to spend time telling fluffy stories, exciting things running rhymes, making things, making riddles and 
making a side show of a sermon? No. We need people to preach the truth. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, there's a good chance you just might go. Because you send yourself, not because Christ sends you. So Paul told Timothy to preach. And so I tell you to preach. Now I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> there was a clergyman in England who was saved by God's saving, who was saved by God's grace. And it forever changed his life. When Jesus changed someone's life, it is permanent. It is to the whole. It is to the total. He began preaching God's word in neighborhood parishes, and a clergyman of one of those parishes was highly offended at the fact that this just normal man, how dare he preach the gospel of Jesus Christ without any formal education. He was one of those people preaching the word. So the bishop of the local parish asked the man to stop. When the bishop confronted him, he said, I hear you have always been preaching the gospel since your salvation. Is there nothing else that you know how to do well? The man said, well, bishop, I do one thing. I talk about the truth. And I do it in season, and I do it out of season. And nothing is going to stop me from presenting Jesus Christ's gospel. So I preach. That's a man who's mission-minded. That's a man whose hearts of others is on his heart. That is a man in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, where it says, For a time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine or sound teaching. This man endured the sound doctrine. He endured the sound teaching. Sadly to say, the bishop is the one who didn't endure the sound doctrine. Can we agree? Sadly. They will have for their ears and will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Oh, dear God, today we have so much of that. We have so many people that want to preach fluff and stuff. They want to tickle your ears with myths and wonders and storytelling when they have forgotten God's gospel truth. But we're to be sober-minded, even if we have to endure suffering. We're to work in an evangelistic way to fulfill the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as that verse goes on to say. That means if I'm having a bad day and somebody tells me, well, what has given you peace and contentment in your life in the midst of your bad day? You say it's Jesus Christ. Get out of your own head, get out of your own way, and present the gospel truth to the person who is hurting in this world. It's not all about you. It's about Jesus But it's possible for a lot of churchgoers to turn aside from the truth and believe a lot of fables. That's why you must be versed in God's Word, in His holy truth. All scriptures God breathed. Don't believe the fables. Don't love the fables. Don't listen to the naysayers and the storytellers. Take God's Word for the truth that it is. Fulfill the ministry that God has called you to fulfill, just the same ministry that Paul called Timothy to fulfill, the same ministry that Christ called Paul to fulfill. And be careful, be watchful. And do it while you're paying attention, not to lead anyone astray. And be a shepherd for all sake. Preach the word. And while you're doing so, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Of an evangelist. Why? Because God has you in a place that he desires for you to fulfill your ministry. No matter where you are. No matter where you are, whether it's in the jail, the prison, the homeless shelter, whether you're a nurse or a doctor, whether you're a police officer, 
whether you're a traffic guard. It doesn't matter. He has asked you to fulfill your ministry wherever you are. Wherever you are. Look, there may be a lot of reasons why and a lot of excuses why you can give me today that you don't need to fulfill your ministry. But God has given it to you. Let me just run a few of those by you real quick as we close this out. Can I? <clears throat> fear. You won't fulfill it because of fear. Oh, but what if they say no to me? Well, they say no. Go to the next person. Erwin Lutzer wrote a book several years ago called The Serpent in Paradise. And he makes mention in this book that about one out of every ten people is receptive to listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ when he presents it to them. One out of ten. Well, doggone it, that's one out of ten. Tell them about it. Why are you living in fear? Unbelief. There's another one. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of your sins? Do you believe that he was buried and resurrected and now sits at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for you in heaven? He's your advocate? Well, yes, I believe that, Pastor Ray. Then you don't have unbelief. Present the gospel for the truth that it is. The cares of the world. Well, I've just got too many things to do. I've got to mow my yard. My house is a wreck. My clothes are dirty. The kids need to be tended to. I've got to fix supper. On and on and on. I don't think anything's more important than a lost soul. So what if your kids eat 10 after 6 instead of 6 o'clock? Huh? Fear of man. What can mere man do to me? Absolutely nothing. That's what. Discouragement? Oh, I've told a half a dozen people and nobody's been receptive to hearing the truth. Discouragement? What have I got to offer? Woe is me, little old me. I don't have much of a testimony. No, but God gave you the testimony that he gave you and he expects you to share it. Quit being discouraged. Quit letting the devil sit on your shoulder and whisper sweet nothings in your ears, which are lies, and be encouraged in Christ. Here's the last one. Besetting sin. I can't present the gospel because I'm not living in such a way that pleases God Almighty. There's one way to change that. It's to ask for forgiveness of your sins. It's to say this, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I fall short of your glory and your grace. But I'm asking you yet again one more time to forgive me for where I have failed you and the things that I've done wrong. I know that you're not only my friend, but you're my Savior. And I no longer desire to be your enemy, but I want to walk within your will for my life. 